Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Miller. Every week, I chat with fascinating people from all walks of life in order to bring you knowledge, inspiration, and insight. If you enjoy the show, you can support it by subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing it with a friend. This is the Jeremy Miller Podcast. Omid Ibrahimi, welcome to the podcast, dude. Stoked to chat with you today. Thank you for having me. Of course, man. So you are a physical therapist based up in Toronto, if I'm saying that correctly. So do you want to just kind of give us a, uh, a little background into who you are, what got you into physiotherapy, what, you got, what got you interested in running specifically, and just kind of a little bit more of your background? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so my, yeah, Omid, as you mentioned, but for the most part, when it comes to my, I guess, passion to get into physiotherapy, it stemmed from my bachelor's degree. I did kinesiology, and from there, you can go multiple different pathways, but typically it would fall under the healthcare, healthcare realm. So I was looking at the chiropractic school, wasn't too interested in that. And then I started sh- uh, shadowing physiotherapy. And I saw that they really integrate the exercise side of things with the rehab. And a lot of it is rehabilitative. But nowadays, they're starting to adopt another approach, which is more prehabilitative, which is a lot of runners, a lot of athletes like to adopt that type of training and plan too, because injuries do happen. But what we can do is try to minimize them or make sure that we can allow athletes to perform at optimal, but ensure that they aren't having to stop their training or competing or games or whatever the case is because of an injury. So after shadowing clinics, I, physiotherapy was something that just gravitated towards me. I then did my master's at Western University. From there, I wanted to do something that was a little bit more in the sports and fitness realm. So a lot of physiotherapy can be in different settings. It can be in hospitals, private clinics. I knew I wanted to work in a private clinic, see general population, but at the same time, I wanted to see a lot of athletes and a lot of people that wanted to get more into sports, into wellness, into fitness. So in Toronto, there are so many run clubs. There is such a huge community when it comes to that. And I've been someone that was very active and involved when it comes to the running scene in high school a little bit in university and kind of since then i fell off and i went more down the strengthening path Mm. i did the strengthening the hypertrophy and i got a little bit more bulkier it was fine but it still wasn't something that i enjoyed just because i wanted some sort of cardio and it's nice when you go to the gym you're lifting heavy weight but then you go up a set of stairs and you're out of breath (laughs) it it kind of sucks and COVID came around and i was like you know what i'm gonna get back into the running I'm going to start building up my mileage. I'm going to still adopt the strengthening program that I've been doing, but just complement it with some running. Since then, I've been very committed to it. I've been running a lot. I've been just overall training and finding a great balance when it comes to the strengthening, when it comes to the running. And a lot of my patients that are now runners, all of them are asking for some sort of tip or they're asking for some sort of service that really integrates the physiotherapy with the running. And then I came up with Saber Running. It's just a name that essentially is rooted in patience, which is a big thing when it comes to running. As in, it's important to get your mileage in, but at the same time, it's important to listen to your body, be patient, be persevere through the tough times, and just trust the process. Because it is a process. There is never an end goal. It's always, can I be better than I was last week? Can I be better than I was last month? So pretty much the Saber Running for me is a way I integrate the physiotherapy with the running, just to ensure that when an injury does happen, we don't completely stop running. We just do a relative loading and we do what some basketball players do, which is load management. That's a big thing of it. It's not so much about Mm -hmm. you're running or you're not running. It's can we still run lower impact and really adopt whatever issue you do have just to ensure that you're still able to get in the mileage. And now we are kind of here, yeah. I love that, dude. Um, Man, that's that's such a cool background i love that and i love that it's all kind of rooted in that uh that desire for like the prehab versus the mm-hmm. rehab like i think you know if you take the prehab seriously enough then you should never have to rehab at all because you've Completely. got you're proactive with everything so i love that it's Completely. all kind of rooted in that always and i feel like a lot of people don't realize it until an injury does happen injury happens and like oh i wish i was a little bit more preventative with my training i wish i did a had a sufficient warm-up or mobility program but then afterwards, it's injuries 
following that specific onset, they're not as common because then they adopt that approach and then they see that, oh, you know what? I'm able to kind of get through my training block without these injuries. There might be pains, aches, sorenesses, but there's never full-blown injuries where I have to stop running completely. Do you think it's possible for somebody to just run? That's all they do, never anything else besides run, no strength training, no stretching, no, no, nothing outside of running and run successfully like and have longevity with it? Do I think they can run successfully in the short term? Maybe. Long term, I do not think that's the case. The biggest thing when it comes to when injuries do present is when I'm seeing patients coming in with some sort of tendinopathy, some sort of joint irritation, they're coming into me. And when I take a subjective history, the biggest thing I notice is they're ramping up their mileage. And when you ask them if they've been doing any sort of strengthening, they say, no, I think that the running is enough. I, I strengthen my legs through my runs, my long runs. That's not enough. You can't be upping the mileage so much and not trying to complement that with the strengthening because that's how injuries happen. Injuries come about not because, they don't come about because we are just ramping up the mileage. They come about because when we go for our long runs, our muscles will slowly begin to fatigue towards the latter kilometers or miles. When that happens, what tends to happen is certain muscles will tend to shut off specifically the glute medius. That is a specific muscle that is very rooted and important when it comes to the running. And it's a muscle that really controls where the knee is positioned during your runs. So what you'll notice is if someone is going for a long run, their first five, 10 kilometers might be good. Their mechanics might be great, but it's not until their last few kilometers that you start to notice that maybe they have that dynamic valgus, which is essentially that the thigh starts coming inwards a bit more. And that's because the glute isn't firing enough. So if you don't have a strong foundation when it comes to the strengthening, you'll start to notice that. And then you'll start to notice issues like gluteal tendinopathy, IT band syndrome. All these issues stem because of the strengthening piece. Dude, that is something I've talked about so many times on this podcast. But like, I think most running injuries <laughs> stem from weak glutes or, or okay. lack of glute activation. Uh, and I can tell... Like if I do deadlifts, if I do RDLs, that kind of stuff, and really focus on just hammering the glutes in the gym, like my running is so much better. Cause it's, you kind of explained it. It's like this big chain reaction of like, if you have knee pain, it's likely not a weakness in your knee. It's like a weakness somewhere up the chain somewhere, right? Mm -hmm, completely. And that's the thing. You just nailed it. It is the fact that when someone does have knee pain, uh, you know what? I should go to strengthen my quads. It's not your quads. It's more your glute because your glute really controls the, <clears throat> coronal or that frontal plane when it comes to running which is more when that leg comes in or out mm -hmm. the quad helps decelerate when we're running it helps with that deceleration that acceleration but what really leads to issues is when we deviate side to side rather than front and back and that is what a lot of people do they tend to google tend to look at resources online which may be helpful at times but when you're so fixated on trying to stay local and not really look at the entire kinetic chain that's when problems start it's a kinetic chain. Running isn't just the knee. It's not just the hip. It's the knee, the hip, the ankle, and all the way up the trunk. So your thoracic mobility is also important when it comes to it. So that's do you a big think, thing you Do you think that the, <laughs> the glute med or the just glute in general, do you think that's like the number one cause of, or the, the number one source of most running injuries? What I would say is the running injuries that I do see, mainly lower extremity, obviously, a lot of them, there is a, the confounding variable there, I guess, would be weak glutes. And you don't really notice it when they're doing a squat. When you're doing a double-legged squat, they have some sort of compensatory movement that really doesn't show that weakness in that glute medius until you get them to do single-legged activities. Then when you get them to do a single-leg mini squat, a hip hinge, or a Bulgarian split squat, you'll start to notice that knee caves in completely. Their trunk rotates the opposite direction just to compensate. Mm -hmm. And it becomes more noticeable but we have to think about it more logically if we're running we're going from it's a very unilateral type movement we're going from one leg, leg to the other if that's the case why don't we train that way too and that's when we start noticing these deficits it's when we train single-legged activities and we're starting to notice that these deviations do come about that people don't really address they think that doing just squats is enough for me but it's not we have to really challenge the entire system we have to really make it specific to running which is going to be unilateral movements dude when i realized that running is a single leg activity <laughs> my mind was blown i was like oh my god it makes so much sense now because it's like you don't think about it really when you're running it's just like you know you go out and run and then if you think about it for a second you're never on both feet at the same time so why would At you all? strength train 
on both feet. Like you got to do the single leg exercises. And that again, for me, in my, in my case, that, that helped tremendously. Um, and that was Mm -hmm. one of the many questions we got. Um, so before we keep going down that rabbit hole, I want to take a chance to just go through some of these questions because we, we put out this poll on Instagram and we got like over a hundred questions submitted. We got a ton. So I kind of grouped them together as best I could. Um, so we'll kind of just mm-hmm. go through these uh, and I'll let you riff on them and then uh, we'll go from there. So uh, yeah, I guess we kind of touched on it, but one of the, like the most common questions we got for sure was just how to stay injury free, like a generalized, like sort of one size fits all <clears throat> approach to just how do you prevent running injuries? Do I think there's a one size fit all approach for everyone? No, but at the same time, is there foundational movements we can do to help with the overall, I guess, or prevent the risk of injuries? Yes. So the biggest thing for me is starting to have more of a regiment when it comes to hip mobility. Again, it's just simple exercises such as hip 90, 90 windshield wipers. It's also stuff that incorporate a little bit more band work. The band work does not mean strengthening. So as in, we have our separate strengthening program, but band work is what I like to emphasize when it comes to pre-runs. Get a bit more glute activation going. <clears throat> it can be clamshells. It can be standing clamshells, which I think are a bit more specific and better for people. But have some band work that really target the glutes. Have some mobility work that target the hips. And just get a bit more active with your warm-ups. You don't have to have a full 20-minute warm-up of stretches and movements and calf sweeps. But for the most part, just focus on the muscles that tend to stem a lot from these injuries, which are the glutes, which are the hips. And just a five-minute program is sufficient. It's just make it effective and make it a habit. People often do it once. There's no injury, so they just neglect it in a sense. So what we have to do is adopt more of a lifestyle change where our warm-up consists of hip mobility drills, It consists of activation work. And then where we get more specific is from a person to person basis in terms of some people might be more tight when it comes to ankle mobility. Some people might be more tight when it comes to their calves, their hamstrings. So it really depends on one's morphology. If someone is shaped a certain way, the muscles that are being loaded might be different versus someone else. In that case, you have to be a little bit more aware of that. Notice which muscles are more sore after my run, before my run, what is more stiff, and then start to create a program based off of that. But for the most part, foundationally, hip mobility program, hip strengthening work, which is going to be just banded work before your runs, is essential. And from there, you have to be a bit more aware of where are you more stiff, where are you more sore, and have a few exercises that target these muscles or joints. Beautiful. So you'd recommend uh, like five minutes of band work before every run or would you recommend just before a speed workout or a long run or just every run in general? So I would say definitely make it a priority before long runs, before speed work, before interval training. Times when you're working a little bit harder or higher intensities, I would say prioritize it. If there are runs where you're working at maybe level two, you're going very easy, then the warm up can essentially be that gradual buildup of your pace. It can be something where you're taking it easy and you're just slowly picking it up. But if you're going into something that is a little bit more intense, I would prioritize the activation work, the warm-ups. And it just takes five minutes. But if you build it into your routine, it will have such a compounding effect in terms of overall benefit for the running. What's your take on doing a a more kind of dynamic uh, band-related warm-up as opposed to like the, the, you know, common stretching or like the dynamic movements yeah like yeah static stretching so like you know you know reaching down touching your toes and like doing the quad stretch all that stuff that you usually see people doing Mm -hmm. my biggest thing is before runs if the idea is to increase our heart rate why not be a bit more dynamic with it and do stretches that also increase our heart rate similarly when we're cooling down after a run what we want to do is slowly bring down the heart rate which is why we would opt to more the static stretching But for me, what I prefer more is, and this is just a personal preference, and some people might like it, some people may not. It's I prefer foam rolling post runs, just more statically and things where I'm not really trying to ramp up the heart rate. But pre-run, I like to be a bit more dynamic with it. So as in, for me specifically, my posterior chain gets very tight. So I like to implement some stretches that have a jogging component to it. As in, I'll do some jogging on the spot and then a calf sweep. Or I'll do some jogging on the spot and then a quad stretch. So just a movement where you're almost trying to be a bit more specific for the runs by adding in that jog and then going into a stretch. 
doesn't have to be super complicated. It's just movements to increase the heart rate and get the muscles ready for the actual workout or the run. Okay. Do you know what the uh, what the science says about static stretching? Because I've heard a million different things. It seems so controversial. Like some people say you have to stretch. Some people mm -hmm. are like, I never stretch. What's your take on that? It's such a mixed bag when it comes to the literature, as in there are some studies that support it, some that refute it. And the biggest thing is based off, you can't base it just off of the empirical evidence, which is great. But a lot of times anecdotally, what I have found is some people are more responsive to it, some are not. But generally speaking, the, the research is very indifferent when it comes to static stretching and the benefits of it. And mainly because they try using the static stretching and they extrapolate it to someone's risk of injury. It's very hard to control studies and look at does static stretching prevent injuries when someone may not get injured or someone may get injured. It's very hard to have that as the causative factor. There could be that correlation to it, but it's very hard to say that static stretching, doing it or not doing it, will or will not lead to injuries. So it's it's very it's a mixed bag. My biggest thing is anecdotally, what do, what works for you? As in, if you're finding yourself less sore the next couple days when you're doing that static stretching, continue it. If you're finding yourself doesn't make much of a difference for you, then you don't really have to prioritize it as much. But I would say try getting in some foam rolling, make it a habit still just to be a little bit more preventative and cautious with it. Okay, so yeah, it seems like a lot of this kind of stuff is so intuitive or, or like it, it takes mm -hmm. time to develop that intuition for each person sure. of like trial and error with all these different things like stretching and like what exercises specifically because obviously everybody's so different, our, our mm -hmm. mechanics are all different. And so um, I feel like that's probably gonna be a theme for a lot of these questions is like- Yeah, fair enough. Just find what works for you. Try everything. If it doesn't work, don't do it. If it seems exactly. to help, then stick to it. Um, 100%. If you had to pick like a handful of just general strength exercises for people, for, for runners, what would you- For runners. Yeah, what would, you, what would you pick? Great question. I would still, even though I said that you shouldn't really prioritize the barbell back squat, I would still add that out, add that into your routine as just more of a foundational exercise. I think that even though running is very unilateral, it's still not a bad idea to incorporate movements that are a bit more compound that involve a squat. So involve that. I would add in Bulgarian split squats. I would add in hip hinges. So with a kettlebell, for example, I think those are essential exercises when it comes to just strengthening that posterior chain and allowing yourself to be a bit more primed when it comes to the running. As in improving performance isn't just at mileage beats, it's about adding in these foundational strengthening exercises that go a long way. So those three exercises, I'm not a big fan when it comes to those machines as in the leg extension or the leg curl machines. Realistically, when are you, my big thing when it comes to the, for example, the leg extension machine is it's not a functional type exercise as in aesthetically, it's great if you want to do it and you want to make your quads look jacked, amazing. But in terms of daily life, when are we really pushing against resistance with our foot in that direction with 150 pounds? Not really. Right. So my big thing is function. My big thing is function and movements like the RDL, movements like the hip hinge movements like the Bulgarians are so much more applicable to one's daily life, whether you're a runner, soccer player, general athlete, than a leg press machine or leg extension machine. Yeah, I see a lot of people training, like lifting like bodybuilders <laughs> and then mm. and then trying to run and it's like they keep getting injured because they have all this mass because they're you know For sure. throwing weight around and they're doing all these like aesthetic exercises, uh, but they don't have any kind of functional ability. And so I, I, Completely. That, and I think the functional stuff is essential it sounds like you know you're saying the same exact thing yeah, yeah. Um, exactly. when you, go ahead just yeah completely right on that a spot on but the biggest thing the biggest thing with it is you're in such a controlled environment when you're on these machines as in the leg extension machine it's so controlled mm -hmm. it doesn't you really turn off that aspect of needing to be a bit more balanced or work on that entire system because you're sitting down you have the you have you're just you're working one specific joint which is a knee versus sport which involves many different joints it is a bit more applicable to do movements that involve all these joints when you say uh hip hinges does yeah. that include um like deadlifts rdls kettlebell swings anything that's like forcing you to hinge right at your hip i'm assuming i completely but the one thing i would say to that is i'm not a big fan of the deadlift 
and oh, only no, because that's my favorite one. I know, I know. <laughs> the deadlift, it's one of those exercises. If you're competing for a strong man, perfect, and you have to do that movement, amazing. But the risk to reward ratio isn't there for me in the sense that a lot of the injuries I see from a clinical perspective, mm. disc herniations that do happen, they usually stem from the deadlift and improper mechanics. I'm not saying you can't do the deadlift with proper mechanics and avoid this specific, specific injury, but you will get a relatively close effect when it comes to that strength piece if you just do RDLs versus the deadlift. Okay. Deadlift is just it involves a bit more mechanics to it, which is where that risk of error increases versus just a RDL. It's kind of hard to mess it up once you get the movement right and you're just loading it a little bit more progressively and it's in a more controlled setting which is what you would typically need okay oh, man i don't know if i'm gonna be able to get <laughs> up my deadlifts i you love the deadlifts to, by the way, <laughs> by the way when, when it comes to my patients that have done deadlifts for so long i never right. tell them to stop it it's just continue it but just so you know the rdl is a great alternative but at the same time if you're someone that enjoys the deadlift why not continue it if your mechanics are great it's right. just for the new runner that isn't really experienced when it comes to lifting weight Start at the RDL first. You don't have to progress the movement by going to the deadlift, but just maybe increase the weight, increase the reps, make it a bit more challenging from that RDL perspective instead of having to opt for a different movement, which would be the deadlift. Okay, that makes that makes perfect sense. <laughs> um, I'm gonna. That's the one time I got to stroke my ego, so I got to keep my deadlifts. <laughs> um, Fair enough, as you should. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we had a lot of people asking about mobility exercises. So maybe like kind of even break down mobility versus strength exercises. Cause I know they're, they, I of would, I would classify them as two different things. At mm -hmm. least I'm not sure Fair about enough. you, but. Same. My, my big thing when it comes to the mobility piece. And again, if we go back to the idea of the hip specifically, I like to do movements that work the joint through its full range of motion, such as the 90 nineties such as hip cars. So it's called controlled articular rotations of the hip. And that can be done in standing, it can be done in the half kneeled position, but it's just movements that really help the joint move through its full rotation instead of working through certain planes. As I see some people doing hip mobility exercises and what they encompass are, say a glute stretch where you bring your knee up to your chest. That's not really a hip mobility exercise. When I say hip mobility, I am referring more to movements that really work that joint through its full range of motion. The hip 90-90 is a great one because you really get into that internally rotated position, which is a lot of, is which is what a lot of people don't do. They go into a lot of that external rotation, which means you're putting your knee outwards. It's like a pigeon stretch. That's more external rotation based, but internal rotation is when you're doing that 90-90, you're leaning forward on that front leg. And then if you can kind of imagine this, that back leg will start to slowly lift up as in you're actively trying to go into that internally rotated position of the hip. Mm. That is so essential just to work that hip through that full range of motion because when it comes to running, although it does seem very linear, your hip does rotate a lot throughout, throughout the entire mechanic. So it's important to really incorporate that mobility piece to it. Aside from that, I would add in some banded mobilization work. Some people get more stiff with their hips. So what I would recommend is take one of those thicker bands that you find at the gym anchor it to some sort of pole, put it very close to where your groin is, apply a lot of traction, and just oscillate into that half kneeling hip flexor stretch. Mm. So that movement where people just go in that half kneeled position, they're doing a hip flexor stretch, that's great, continue that. But add in that band to allow the hip to be a bit more tractioned out so it doesn't become irritated. Issues like impingement for runners, which is very common, that stems because that hip doesn't work through its full range of motion. And sometimes you might just need to traction it out with a band. Beautiful. What about, yeah. um, is like, Strengthening? can you, well, I was going to say knee mobility, cause that, that's kind of a tough one. Cause mm -hmm. your knee sort of only moves in one or two directions. Uh, do you have some knee but, mobility recommendations? So, so, so the biggest thing with the knee, I guess I would go more so that quad stretch, the hamstring okay. stretch, but at the same time, another movement that would require the knee to go through its full range of motion is a tibialis anterior stretch, which is essentially where your foot is in a fully flexed position and you're essentially kneeling on your feet. So you're going to get more of a stretch for that tibialis. But at the same time, you have to go through that full range of knee flexion to get there. And I would recommend that for runners a lot because that movement of dorsiflexion when we are running through our gait, over the course of a long run or a high mileage week, that will tend to get a bit more sore or tender. So it's important to incorporate that tibialis anterior stretch. 
Okay. And then what about for ankles? We got a lot of questions about ankle yeah. stuff. We'll, I will dive into that fully later, but maybe just like ankle mobility stuff. Yeah. I like to go with the classic, just ankle circles. I like to go clockwise, counterclockwise, can do it 10 to 12 times. And then I like to add in a lot of dorsiflexion work, as in with or without a band, as in if you add a band around the ankle, it would be around the front of the ankle, pushing the ankle joint backwards. That is essentially an exercise I like, but all you're going to be doing is keeping your heel planted and you're just bending the knee, trying to get it as close as possible to the wall mm -hmm. and just oscillate in and out of that stretch. If you're someone that has very stiff ankles, then maybe add a band. Add a band where that crease is of the ankle, just so there's some backwards force or some a bit of force that does go backwards that does help the ankle become a bit more mobilized. But essentially dorsiflexion is the big thing I would recommend for people. And plantar flexion, we pretty much have full range of that, which is where you're going toes away from you. That's mm -hmm. a good one, but I would just recommend just doing a bit of calf stretching. Okay, sweet. Mm -hmm. One of the ones I do a lot, cause I get really tight, uh, like soleus and like lower, yeah, yeah. like lower calf area. I'll yeah, take, yeah. It's, I guess it's uh, similar to like the, the ankle circles you're talking about, but I'll, I'll like take a band, wrap around my like end of my foot and then do, I call my like gas pedals where I just like do the flexion or I'll uh, like try and spell out the alphabet with my big toe. Yes. And the, the point of it is just to like get as much movement and range of motion in that ankle and that like, it feels a hundred percent better after I, after I do it for like two or three minutes. hundred percent. And you know what I would actually add to that when it comes from a strengthening perspective, take a towel, put it on the ground, barefoot, just work on toe towel squeezes. As in you're mm. trying to bring that towel into one ball, do it for 15, 20 reps, open it up, repeat it one more time. Working on those intrinsic foot muscles goes a long way for running. As in the foot is so involved when it comes to that running mechanic, but we often fixate on the calf, the quad, the hamstring. We completely neglect the foot. So doing a movement like that, that really activates the intrinsic foot muscles will ensure that during your gait, when there is that supination, that pronation, you're a bit more supported. That and also a big one that people will often forget is big toe extension. A lot of runners, they might be a bit more limited when it comes to that big toe. And that is a specific joint, the first MTP joint, which is the toe where it makes contact with the foot itself. It becomes very irritated for a lot of runners. And a lot of the shoes I see nowadays, the Nikes, some of the Kinvaras, the, the Sauconies, they have a very narrow toe box, which causes that big toe to deviate more laterally or kind of inwards, where mm -hmm. it forms a bunion. But when that bunion starts to form slowly, you lose that big toe extension, which means you don't get the full the full mechanic of your of your gait of your stride and that leads to issues because you're no longer relying on that big toe extension which means that your gait is completely compensated and you're not getting enough of that pro pronation or that support from that pronation of the big toe we got a lot of questions about feet stuff because um, mm -hmm. obviously a lot of runners have feet issues yeah. uh, one question we got a few times um, which I'm, I'm personally really curious about this is uh, what is your take on barefoot shoes for like everyday use? Maybe not running with barefoot shoes or maybe I know, I know some people do, but yeah. just generally your take on barefoot shoes. Barefoot shoes, I think, is a very helpful thing when you have issues with your mechanics. A lot of people think that heel striking is a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing unless you start having knee and hip pain and you're noticing that the heel is landing in a certain position or angulated a certain way where a lot of that shock is going in through the knee and the hip. That's when I would recommend wearing barefoot shoes because it helps you switch or transition away from that heel striking to more midfoot striking. And it helps almost normalize that gait or help with those specific injuries. So I would say barefoot running or wearing those shoes that are very minimally supported are great when you're trying to work on A, the intrinsic foot muscles, or if you're noticing some sort of error in your mechanics, which is causing knee or hip pain. Yeah, if you try and run with barefoot shoes, there's no way you're going to heel strike. <laughs> it no, is a, yeah, not at all. Not at all. It's, it's painful. Very painful. Um, yeah. What about uh, like just wearing barefoot shoes or being barefoot? Just I think you kind of said it, but like just generalized like foot strength, and like lower leg strength. Do you see any benefit to that? I do think there is a lot of benefit to that just because of, again, of that intrinsic foot muscle piece. And at the same time, you don't realize how weak the intrinsic foot muscle or how or inactive they are until you run barefoot and see how sore your feet are afterwards. So I would definitely recommend it. 
unless someone does have some sort of issue such as a plantar fasciitis. I wouldn't recommend it in that case, obviously. But when it comes to trying to work on your mechanics, trying to strengthen the intrinsic foot muscles, trying to work on that gait of how we're, how we're striding and how much supination and pronation we do have, I would for sure say try to add in some barefoot running into your training block. But at the same time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use barefoot running as the sole type of running when it comes to training, as in I would mix it up a bit. And maybe on my easier runs, I might go barefoot. On other days when it's more of a serious training block, I would go to more supportive shoes. Okay. Would you recommend if people were to do barefoot, should they try and keep it uh, on like a treadmill or keep it on like grass or dirt rather than like going out and hammering out miles on the concrete? I think treadmill would be a better idea if you can. If you have access to a gym, it might look a little bit off if you're running barefoot. But at the same time, if you have a private treadmill to you or you can, if you're confident enough to go into the gym with bare feet, I would recommend trying it out on a treadmill first. Going outside, running on pavement might be a bit too tough. So if it is for that one person that can't manage that amount of impact through their feet, I would recommend softer terrains such as a track. Um, you can do grass, but at the same time, just to be a bit more safe and avoid any sort of spraining of the ankle. Yeah. I would minimize if it is, if it's a turf field, perfect. But if it is just a big park that you can't really tell how many branches or I guess rocks there are within your stride or your, I guess your running path, then I would maybe opt away from that. But for the most part, stick to treadmill, maybe a track if you have access to that. And pavement is not bad as long as you have more a supportive type of barefoot shoe. Sweet. Uh, and then we did get a lot of questions about plantar fasciitis as well. I mm -hmm. I personally have had it and it is so painful. It is not it fun. Is, yeah. Um, yeah, and the barefoot same. shoes actually, like, <clears throat> I, I don't know if it was just a correlation or causation, mm -hmm. but when I started wearing barefoot shoes, plantar fasciitis totally went away for me. Did you know that? I guess when you were starting to wear the barefoot shoes, did you notice the or I guess what state was the plantar fascia? Was it flared up at the time or was it kind of calmed down? Uh, it seemed like it was like peak of the, I see. the symptoms. Um, and I never even ran with barefoot <laughs> shoes. I just switched from like my everyday walking around shoes. I think there was right. one like Vans to okay. barefoot shoes. And it, it seemed like it went away fairly quickly after that. Right. You know what? When it comes to the plantar fasciitis, because it is that fascia that is typically more irritated, Specifically where the, the fascia does connect to the heel is a, a point where people will find the most pain when it comes to plantar fasciitis. And when you get a little bit more involvement of the intrinsic foot muscles, which comes with wearing barefoot shoes, you'll start to notice that that plantar fascia doesn't get as stretched or lengthened. If it doesn't get as stretched or lengthened during your gait, it means it's, there's going to be less pulling of that fascia from the heel, which would correlate over to less heel pain. So that is a relation when it comes to intrinsic foot muscles and when it comes to the plantar fascia. It's not so much that the fascia miraculously heals. It's just more so that there isn't as much of the pulling of the fascia from the heel itself. Okay. Are there some things you'd recommend to prehab or rehab plantar fasciitis? What I would recommend is, again, that toe toe crunch, as in working those intrinsic foot muscles. At the same time, if someone doesn't have fascial pain, I would still recommend the lacrosse ball to the foot and just kind of work on that rolling maybe 20 to 30 seconds per side. Big toe extension is a big part. There is a There are studies that support the relation between limited big toe extension and plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm. So in terms of mobility in that big toe, it's a big thing. And on top of that, I would recommend some calf raises because a lot of calf or calf raises and calf stretching, as in tightness in the calves, can lead to or have that correlative factor to plantar fasciitis. But at the same time, when there isn't as much of that loading through the calf, it also has a relation to plantar fasciitis. So I'd say if you're someone that maybe does a lot of calf raises, start adding in a little bit more stretching. If you're someone that does a lot of stretching, not enough calf raises, add that into your routine if you do have that plantar fasciitis. Sweet. That's beautiful. Um, one question I was really curious about was what you'd <clears throat> prescribe for active recovery because i there's so many like i don't know if i want to call them gimmicks but like trends out there like mm -hmm. ice baths and like the massage guns and the compression boot things <laughs> um like what's your take on all that as opposed to just like active recovery 
so the biggest thing when it comes to that is every or I guess all these devices modalities they adopt the rice protocol whether it's the ice bath whether it's the pneumatic compressive stockings they all adopt the rice protocol in some degree which essentially would minimize or try to reduce that swelling or inflammation that might come about after a hard session of running when it comes to the ice is there that analgesic effect yes as in it does feel better right after amazing but in terms of helping with recovery after a run there isn't as much letter literature to support that as in the person who came up with the rice protocol what they later found out was he kind of came out and said yeah you know what like i was kind of wrong when it came to the idea of icing post run or icing my knees for example is what you'll find a lot of basketball players or runners may be doing and ice or i guess the idea of swelling and inflammation it's not necessarily a bad thing when you have more swelling more inflammation to some degree as in if it's a full-blown swelling situation then that's a problem we want to ice and control but if you do have some soreness a bit of inflammation that blood flow to the area does help with the healing and what we want to do is encourage more blood flow to those certain muscle groups which is why i do prefer the more active approach of for example going for a walk low intensity swim cycling doing movements that aren't as impactful on the joints and the muscles but still get blood flow into those areas when we get more blood flow to those areas we help with that overall recovery piece dude that is so reassuring to hear because of course yeah, yeah. I, I have a cold plunge here and uh yeah, i yeah. used to do it right after my runs and then i heard somebody say like hey you shouldn't do it right after a workout because it i know it kills like strength hypertrophy mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. like you just said it it stops that inflammation but from my understanding and you kind of just said it i think is like the inflammation is our body's natural response to stress and to you know exercise and so the inflammation yeah. is a good thing after exercise right completely and it's that idea of progressive overload as in we want our body to start adapting. If we're adding in these modalities, these thermal agents of ice, then it doesn't really allow our body to fully adapt in a sense. Not saying that you're not gonna improve if you're putting in high mileage, good strengthening program, but at the same time to optimize it, we have to really embrace that inflammation period. We have to really embrace it because it's our body's way of repairing, recovering, and ensuring that next time we go out for that same run, it may not feel as effortful or we might feel better when we're doing that specific workout. Okay. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. Is there a, would you recommend like, <clears throat> is there a time and place for those like percussive therapy that, you know, the massage guns and the ice baths and the compression boots, is there a time and place for that? Or should we just kind of ignore all those altogether? No, you know what? I would say the percussive therapy, the foam rolling, all these sort of things, they kind of do the same thing in terms of helping the muscles relax a bit. So I wouldn't say that we completely throw it away. My big issue is with people thinking that ice is the main mm -hmm. source of recovery when it comes to running or working out. But when it comes to the percussive devices, it's kind of similar in a sense to what you would get after a massage. As in if someone were to do more massage therapy on you, you're getting more of that blood flow to that area, which would again help with that overall healing process. So I wouldn't say necessarily drop the percussive devices, the compressive boots, they may be good just because they add that compressive feature to it. But again, what happens is they go from the compression goes it is lessened from or I guess it decreases going distal to superficial. So the closer you are to your torso, the pressure would slowly increase to really help encourage that return of blood flow to the heart and just help with that overall recovery piece. That's something I wouldn't adopt as much just because I don't mind the... <clears throat> the blood flow, the inflammation to the muscle groups. But the ice is something I would kind of veer away from, at least more on a longer term basis. But I would stick to the percussive devices of the massage gun, of the foam rolling, of the compressive boots, hit or miss for a lot of people. But for me, I would kind of stick to those two. And then I would complement it with more an active recovery session, which is walking, which is swimming, which is cycling. Movements that don't really stress the body as much, but allow that blood flow to be a bit more sufficient. Beautiful. I love that. Um, let me go through some of these questions we've got. Um, let's go back to strength training a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, how many days a week would you recommend people strength train? Say they're training for a half marathon or a marathon. Mm -hmm. Honestly, you don't need more than three sessions a week. And for those more novice runners that are getting into that strengthening piece, two times a week would be sufficient. But ideally, three times a week is more than you need. That 
doesn't mean we just focus on lower body, by the way, as in when we're coming for these strengthening sessions, it's can we, again, emphasize the lower extremity with our leg days, but at the same time, working the upper body is also important. So two to three sessions a week will help kind of cross off the push days, the pull days, the leg days, and that's all you need. Do that, complement it with a good structured running program, and that is sufficient when it comes to training for a specific time, training for a race, and just trying to ensure you get to the start line without any injuries. What is the justification for upper body strength training? Because um, I, a few like elite runners I know, they say that they mm -hmm. basically don't do any upper body. Like they just do like a, a couple like days a week. But yeah. for me personally, I just feel good when I lift upper body, of but course. I don't really know. You, it sounds like you believe there's some benefit. So what do you think the benefit mm -hmm. is or, or what's the justification? My biggest thing is in general, foundationally, three days of strength thing is important. We're not going to be doing three days a week of leg day. So if we're not going to be doing leg day for three days a week, then why not do leg day for once a week, maybe twice a week. But one of those days while you're getting those muscles to kind of allow it to recover, add in a strengthening day. And at the same time, we are very fixed on the idea that running is such a lower extremity type exercise, which it is. But at the same time, there's a lot of thoracic rotation that is involved when it comes to running because we're, our arms are swinging side to side. We have to maintain a more upright posture when it comes to running. And when you'll, what you'll notice towards someone fatiguing after a long run or a hard race is their entire mechanics are broken down. As in, not just the lower extremity, but their upper body, their kind of shallow breathing, their chest isn't upright. These are all issues that stem down to that posterior chain. So if you can kind of work that posterior chain, not just from hips down, but from trunk all the way down, then you're in a better position to perform better biomechanically during those harder runs, harder workouts, than someone that just prioritizes the lower extremity days. Okay, so runners can have can have some strong upper bodies as well. I like of to course, hear that. Of course, yeah. You know what? <laughs> Running is one of those things that you won't notice the benefit of how much strengthening does for you until you do it. Right. And then you'll notice that when you have a good regimen to it, you become so much faster. It becomes so much more effortless. Mm -hmm. And anecdotally for myself, I was running, I was competing track and cross country in high school. And my long runs, I'd go for them. And at the time I was going maybe what, 17 to 20 ish kilometers, maybe I was going at like, I don't know, 350 per kilometer ish. And I was exhausted, but that was me working a schedule where I'm getting up to 90, a hundred kilometer weeks, but no strengthening. Mm. And then I ramped down the strength. I ramped down the mileage to my current state of training for a marathon. I'm doing maybe 70 to 80 kilometer weeks for now. I might take it up to a hundred. But adding in that strengthening piece, I go through these same phases, these same effort when it comes to the running, but I don't feel as exhausted. And I was training much harder then, and I was competing then. So it's just one of those things, it's hard not to attribute it to the strengthening piece. And I notice that weeks when I don't do the strengthening, it is very exhaustive to go for those runs and maintain those paces. Then weeks when I have that strengthening, I might be sore during my run, but I feel way better than not doing strengthening at all. Yeah, dude, I, I can attest to that 100%. Like mm -hmm. this last weekend, I really noticed it because I had a uh, 18 mile long run. Um, yeah. So that's what, like probably 30, 30K, I think. And yeah. uh, it, like, I felt great throughout the whole run. And I just remember thinking back to like, I had a very similar workout, even just like six, seven months ago, mm -hmm. and how I felt at the end of that versus this one. And like, I felt like my form, I know it, my form like kept strong and, right. and my form was good throughout the whole run. And then even like the following day, like I wasn't sore at all. And I, obviously you get those adaptations through more and more running, but I have to attribute a lot of it to the strength training and just having more muscular endurance and Completely. Um, all the benefits you get from strength training. Completely. And you know what I would say to that is you can also have those adaptations when you go for 100, 120 kilometer weeks, but that risk of injury increases so much more than if you down the mileage and you just up that strengthening. You'll have the same benefit, but less of a risk of injury. So you can habituate to it. It's just, why don't you habituate to a program that would minimize that risk of injury? Because when injuries typically happen is when someone ups their volume of running and they get into their 100 or 100 and 
10, 15, 20 kilometer weeks, that's when injuries tend to come up. One of my favorite studies regarding strength training uh, is that it was actually a study, you've probably seen it, I'm sure, um, where yeah. they were looking at the benefits or, or the effects of sodium on cramping as opposed to strength training and cramping. And it actually showed, uh, it was like a super surprising result that they didn't expect, was that the people who strength train just one day a week for their lower body actually cramped less than the people who, it's not surprising, they didn't cramp Oh, gosh, I'm butchering this. The people who strength trained one day a week cramped far less than the people who didn't strength train at all. But they also found that the people who strength trained, um, what am I trying to say? Basically, the strength training had an even bigger effect on cramping versus sodium intake and electrolytes, which was crazy. Like, I mm -hmm. think it, it probably comes down to the muscular endurance, I would imagine. Completely, yeah. It's when, when our body starts to again when we're going for these runs we're sweating so much during the process and when we're fatigued enough we lose a lot of sodium from our body when we lose a lot of that sodium piece that cramping does happen when you add in that strengthening piece it's not so much that strengthening equals i guess more sodium retention it just means that you're not as fatigued during your run you're not at a higher heart rate you're not sweating as much which means mm -hmm. that you're able to minimize that cramping that would come up so oh, not necessarily okay. that it helps retain the sodium or helps with any sort of aspect of that. It's just the fact that we're not fatigued as much. We're not as exhausted during those runs. So that cramping is less common than, for example, someone might be on some sort of sodium supplement. That makes perfect sense. Okay, so it's more mm -hmm. so of just like your muscles fatigue less, so they're not working quite as hard. So they're mm -hmm. demanding less sodium, less electrolytes. Yeah. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Less, okay. less sodium excretion, essentially, yes. Okay, beautiful. That makes sense. I just I totally butchered that. I'm, this is why I'm not a this is why I'm not a doctor or a scientist. No, you're either. good though, because you know what? I I've been following your content for so so long now, and a lot of the stuff you do preach and you do inform your audience on it goes hand in hand with what we preach from a physiotherapy basis. So you do your research when it comes to it, and a lot of it is validated, which is the biggest piece. It's validated. It's good good information, and the way you do present it is in a way that can that the audience can translate well to. As they understand it, you're able to present it in a layman term, and it makes it very easy for the audience to digest and actually apply. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I try and, yeah. I mean, for me, a lot of it just comes down to like, how can I understand this? My, how can my monkey brain understand this, this <laughs> scientific study? And I just take that and I'll be like, okay, maybe other people can understand it too. Um, of course, yeah, I love, apply it to I, yourself. Yeah, and I love the like the scientific backup behind all this stuff is like because anecdotally i experience a lot of it i think a lot of people do but yeah i love being able to find a study that shows and confirms all this stuff because it's like completely. you can't argue with data completely okay let's go uh through some more of these questions we're, we're hammering through them i love it we're get, getting a ton of information out there these are great questions um okay so what are some signs uh maybe people can like be on the lookout for if an injury might be oncoming maybe they're not fully injured but an injury might be creeping up. Is there anything mm -hmm. to look out for in that instance? That's a great question. What I would say is be a bit more reflective on your training volumes. Either A, your mileage is very high, you're going from, your the volume of running is too much, or B, you're going from no running, you've had a hiatus for a few weeks, and you're trying to go into a week of 60 to 70 miles. So it's one of those two things to be a bit more reflective on. Another thing to be on the outlook on the lookout for is give yourself a couple of days to just recover, ensure that you're feeling a bit better. You can apply a little bit of that price protocol, more specifically with the compression, more with the elevation aspect of it. If it is some sort of tendinopathy or muscular type issue, if you're noticing you're getting back into easier runs and that pain is still there and it hasn't improved and it's maybe getting a bit worse, then I would say be a little bit more preventative with it. Because at that stage, it hasn't been a full-blown issue, but be a bit more preventative, as in get it checked out. Make sure you have a trained healthcare professional that can look at it and give you some suggestions on how to prevent this from becoming a full-blown issue. But for the most part, when you're noticing these sorenesses or aches that might be more than an ache, give yourself a few days off just to see if your body can recover from it and go back in for that run. If you're noticing that pain is still there or it is slowly increasing the more you are running, then I would say seek some professional guidance for it. What would your advice be to the, 
the Goggins followers out there who say, I don't care how bad it hurts, how injured I am. I'm just going to keep yeah, running yeah. through it. I have a race in two weeks. I'm not going to miss this race. What would your advice be to them on like, okay, making the decision between, should I, I'm going to stop running, I'm going to stop training, take you know a couple <laughs> weeks off, or just keep running through the pain? So my biggest thing with that is the only time I would encourage maybe to run through the pain, and if it's something that is very important to you, is during race day. You might be feeling that pain that might be more of a strain and you want to kind of power through it by all means go ahead this is the race you've been training for for many months go at it but when it comes to the training block itself i would recommend people to err on the side of caution because the idea of no pain no gain is not necessarily true as in if you have a bit of and you have to be a little bit more real with yourself as in there are some sort of pains as in fatiguing pain or your muscles are aching a bit more because you have a hard session and you're pushing through that that dull achiness is okay but if the pain ever becomes sharp if it ever becomes shooting that's when you want to err on the side of caution and take a few days or a week or so off just to ensure you're there for race day because a lot of times what i find is people are so fixated on hitting their weekly mileage their numbers that they do not listen to their body when you don't listen to your body and how it responds to all these stressors that's when injuries come about they look at these online programs when it comes to some sort and these online programs they can be great but at the same time use them as a basis but be a bit more reflective and aware of your body throughout the process as in if the week in that training schedule for the half marathon training block says go for a 14 kilometer run and your body's a little bit sore it's kind of banged up maybe take it a bit easier you don't have to do it that day save it for a couple days after that so my biggest thing with that is the idea of no pain no gain be a bit try distinguishing the pain of it being sharp shooting versus more dull achiness fatiguing type pain and also be real with yourself and your body and understand that if you are having any sort of burnout any sort of soreness or any sort of issue where you feel like your body has taken a lot of beating through the week that it, that rest day might do more for you than doing that workout but omid who's yeah. going to carry the boats dude <laughs> i don't know who's going to be carrying the boats the logs it's, it's going to be a tough one but we're going to have to find someone else yeah. <laughs> i love goggins uh goggins is what, great i love what he does but sometimes it's like just be smart <laughs> and mm-hmm. you just you explained all that perfectly so i think that's and great. Gog- by the way, Goggins is very smart with it too, as in he pushes through the pain. Don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying not push through the pain, but discern what type of pain it is. If it's a right. sharp type of pain that is increasing significantly throughout your runs, then take a few days, few weeks off, maybe seek professional guidance. But if the pain is more of a dull achiness, it's fatiguing, it's something that you're just working too hard, you're getting into those lactate zones, by all means, push through it. If you can, if you have that mental endurance to kind of get through it, by all means. But just discerning it is the biggest thing to ensure that we don't get injured and we can show up on race day healthy and be able to perform the best we can. That's beautiful. I I always say like there's a difference between being or what is it? There's a difference between hurt and hurting, meaning like completely. Oh, I'm hurting right now versus like, oh, I'm actually hurt. Like I'm injured. And it's like for sure. I I think a lot of it just takes time and, and experience of like going through things. Sometimes you might have to push a little bit harder to get to those points to to Mm -hmm. really develop that understanding. But yeah, just finding that intuition for, uh, for finding the differences between those, um, say somebody is injured and they're unable to run for, you know, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever. What are some other ways to cross train and, uh, and make sure that they're, or do what they can to not lose out on all the fitness that they built up. Mm -hmm. Usually when it comes to running related injuries, they're more impact related as in the more tendinopathies, Achilles, patella tendinitis, some sort of hip issue. So if there are more impact dependent and more load dependent when it comes to that injury piece, what I would recommend is do exercises, do movements, do cross training that is low impact or no impact. It could be swimming, it could be Stairmaster, it could be cycling, elliptical, just different movements that don't load the bodies or those joints or muscles as much, but you can still maintain that sort of aerobic base. At the same time, you're not going to have that same aerobic conditioning as you would when you're running, but it'll help prevent how much of a deconditioned state you're going to be in if you start to add in these sorts of aerobic exercise. Should you try and say like if you're running, let's just say like 
50 miles a week. So close to a hundred, hundred K a week. Uh, yeah. Should you try and like, um, uh, equate your time spent cross training say say that you're running 10 hours a week i guess is a better okay. way to put it running 10 hours a week should you do the same thing for cross training like 10 hours on a bike or do you need to because it's all if it say it's all zone two training basically would it just of be course. the same time i i would say that but at the same at the same time when it comes to the specifics of cross training and zone two that zone two can would be probably less intense on a bike for a runner than running itself and that's more so attributed to the fact that our muscles are trained a certain way when it comes to running that we are a bit more deconditioned when it comes to getting onto a bike and you'll start noticing that if you're a very cardiovascularly fit person as from a running perspective and you try translating that over to biking it's not the same thing you're going to be a bit more fatigued more tired it's going to be more exhaustive so you have to be a little bit more real when it comes to what intensity is for you because it's very easy to get on a bike think that going for an hour on the bike is similar to that hour run but you might be in diff different zones because of that and because of the fact that you haven't trained your muscles oxidatively the same while running versus cycling okay so it's probably just a little bit more subjective of like each person and, and figuring out what intensity they should go at uh Com completely okay. in that in that sense as in going through the intensity aspect of it as in make sure that you're in that specific zone even though it would be at a much lower intensity on that bike than while you're running but at the same time when it comes to when it comes to that idea of cross training it's very for a specific injury it's very dependent on what that injury is there are certain injuries that that translation of 10 hours of running to 10 hours of cross training on a bike or swimming is okay but there can be certain conditions that you have to do more of a rounded assessment to have an idea of whether that translation makes sense or not but from a general basis yes that translation is okay but you have to be a bit more specific when it comes to the type of injury okay that makes perfect sense uh would you recommend strength training before or after a run because obviously a lot of these days you have to do two a days run yeah, and a lift in the same day is there i guess also i'm curious what the science has to say because i've never actually looked that up mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I haven't looked into the science of that specifically, but in terms of clinically, what makes the most sense would be if your goal is to run a marathon, it's more running related, prioritize your energy and you prioritize your energy on that running piece, which means that you do it before your strengthening workout. You do that and then you follow it up with that strengthening piece because even though there shouldn't be that much of a difference in terms of your effort level, you typically want to knock down the mileage or that workout when it comes to the running because it would be a little bit more important than that strengthening piece. Not to say that you completely neglect and you half-ass the strengthening part of it, but at the same time, if your goal is to run that marathon, what would be a bit more important is making sure that your times, your pacing is a bit more aligned when it comes to that running versus that strengthening. Sweet. And in terms in terms of the studies, there isn't anything that really, at least from the strengthening versus running piece, there isn't hard evidence that comes about when it when they talk about whether doing strengthening first is more effective or doing running first is more effective. It's just oh, I might have to I might have to take that again. You're good. You're good. Okay. Sorry, my dogs. <laughs> give him just, just a second. <laughs> take his time. I think the mailman's here. He wants to give his two cents when it comes to the podcast. That's what yeah. it is. <laughs> he said, no, you have to run first. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. All right. I think they're done. Uh, maybe there just take go. it up from where you said uh, what the literature has to say about it. Or basically, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't say much about it. Yeah. So when it comes to the literature of whether strengthening or running first makes the most sense, the literature does not really have a salt they don't have solid evidence when it comes to what is more important or what is more effective the biggest thing when it comes to it is what are your goals if your goal is more strength related then prioritize the strengthening piece before you run if it's more running related such as running a marathon then prioritize the run first just because you will have some degree of exhaustion of fatigue that will happen after that specific form of exercise so just make sure that your efforts go towards that specific exercise that you're planning to compete or do a race in, for example. 
Okay, that makes perfect sense. And then kind mm-hmm. of a follow-up to that is um, I personally do all my leg days uh, the same day as speed workouts or long runs. Um, okay. Because to me, like, again, anecdotally, it just makes more sense. My legs are probably going to be tired from my speed workout or my long run, so I might as well just stack that leg day so I have more time in between to recover. Uh, Mm -hmm. Does the science say anything about that, or what is your take on how to structure your leg days with your speed speed workouts and long runs? What the science shows is the idea of DOMS, which you might have heard about, which is delayed onset muscle soreness, which anecdotally how that might feel like to you is you work out, the next day you're a bit sore, but not really that sore. It's the next couple of days that it really kind of has a hit on you. So what I would say that when it comes to when you should do that specific leg day, do it either on the same day as your speed workout or a harder session or the next day, just because those legs aren't as sore or fatigued or heavy versus when you do it a couple of days afterwards, 48 to 72 hours after. So what I would say is try to manage your running schedule or your working out schedule in a way where the next couple days after a strengthening day, you have a easier run or an easier workout or maybe an upper body day. So just it makes a bit more sense to have a more active recovery day the couple days after a strength day than on than having a harder workout. Okay. Again, very reassuring. I, yes. I've, so, I've started finding all these things on my own, so I love to hear that there's actual like science behind all this stuff. The thing is you're very subconscious with it too, as in when you are very immersed into the sports, into the running, into the fitness scene, you start to know what makes sense for your body, what doesn't make sense, and that science just further validates it. But a lot of times what we subconsciously do is we do harder workouts on days when our body is – we do harder workouts on days when our body's a bit more fresh and when would it not be fresh or feeling as re- recharged is a couple days after a harder leg day. So we take all this evidence and we subconsciously create our workout schedule in a way that makes sense for us and our body and what we are more responsive to. And that is what the science shows. The science shows just that. And we're just adopting these principles very subconsciously and very automated because we have been so immersed in that fitness and that running scene that over time you have a good sense of what makes the most sense for you and what is most effective for you and what is it yeah i I think it's you know like you said a lot of it's subjective a lot of it's just like what helps you or what works for you anecdotally Mm -hmm. um but i think you know for somebody who has no experience and there's like they're they're training for their first marathon so they have no idea that's where the science would come into play and like you know these more established things but from there like don't be so strict on what the science says like if it doesn't work for you don't do it like just you know just find things that that tend to work for you yeah the thing about science is also that if it is some sort of randomized controlled trial Controlled trials are great because they will have a bit of a closer correlative or causative cause and effect type of thing. But at the same time, exercise, wellness, fitness, running, it's never in a controlled environment. We're never in a lab. We're never in a setting where it is that controlled. So we have to take everything with a grain of salt and see what works for us. And at the same time, I would say that anecdotally, try to keep try to anecdotally appreciate what you find versus what the literature shows, which means that you don't completely neglect the literature, but at the same time, take it with a grain of salt and see what works for you anecdotally, what works for other people anecdotally, because sometimes what works for them, it's very hard to translate that over to a controlled trial. Yeah, and I think just being aware and uh, acknowledging how you feel as much as possible, mm-hmm. like whether it's through a journal, like I know a lot of people keep running journals or they'll write things down. Um, I think that's helped me a lot is just like asking yourself how you feel. Cause some people just go through the motions and they don't really acknowledge how they ever feel. And they're just kind of doing it because it seems right, but they don't really take a second to reflect on it. For sure. And you know what? The biggest issue I find when it comes to that is people will, and what I would journal specifically is effort level. It comes to our runs because a lot of times, a lot of times what will again lead to that injury what will lead to that burnout what will lead to underperforming for a race is not taking our easy runs easy Mm. not working within that level two everyone gets very excited everyone thinks that i have to go hard go hard or go home type of thing as in that david goggins type Mm. mentality which is great but at the same time listen to your body because those days when you have an easy run and you actually 
and you actually follow that as is, it has such an effect in terms of how great the quality workouts are and how well you are prepared for the actual race or that run. So prioritizing yeah. easy runs is a is such an important thing that is constantly reiterated, but people don't adopt it because they just get very excited during those runs and it never is conversational when they end up doing their easy run. It always starts yeah. off easy, then it, they kind of pick it up, which is how injuries happen. Yep. Yeah, I had to, uh, for me, it was my ego a lot, I think, because it's like, once you get Strava, you start posting stuff on yeah, yeah, for the sure. internet, mostly, or like somebody yeah. you, know, you see at work or whatever, they're like, how'd your run go? How fast did you run? It's like, <laughs> oh, I did, I did eight minutes a mile today or whatever. It's like, yeah, yeah. I got, I had to get rid of that. And now, of course, like, I don't care if I'm running 10 minutes a mile. Uh, I don't 100%. know what that is in kilometers, but it's like, yeah, yeah. probably five or six minutes per kilometer. It's like, yeah very slow compared to like what my marathon pace is going to be it's like four minutes a mile slower some days but, but it's just like just get the miles in get the time on your feet and uh because you're not really concerned obviously about you know what your performance is that day it's just getting the miles in right it, that's all it is and you know what you'll see that straw of meme of someone saying god for an easy run and you look at the heart rate is like 185 yeah, yeah. so <laughs> it's just I, being a little bit more real with yourself yeah, I think we've all been there at some point. Like you said, we just get excited, and um, it's a new sport if you're new to running, and it, it makes total sense. Um, I think right. it's I think it's fine to go hard, but at the same time, if you're training for that marathon, be a little bit more strict with your easy days and your harder days. Yep, hundred um, percent. All right, the last thing we kind of do is a bunch of people just kind of sent in like shin splints, runner's knee, yes. Achilles tendonitis, all this kind of stuff. So maybe I'll like list off or I'll like say out a uh one of these like common running injuries and then you could say like i don't know like what causes it and maybe some potential ways to rehab it or prevent yeah. it if that works um yeah. just because i know a lot of people at some point will probably deal with a lot of these so let's kind of kinda, I, I organize it so we'll start like higher up on the body and just kind of work our way down all the way to of the course. feet um so it band syndrome of course IT band syndrome, which is typically maybe 10 to 15% of runners will experience at some time, maybe lateral knee pain, but essentially the IT band is a fascia. It's not a contractile tissue as in it's not a muscle where it contracts or it has some sort of strengthening component to it. But what happens is higher up towards the hip, the tensor fascia lata, the TFL, and the glute, the glute maximus, they have attachment points onto that IT band. So if there is some sort of imbalance from a strength perspective or tightness perspective that are stemming from the hip, specifically the TFL or the glute max, it'll start pulling a little bit more on that IT band. If it pulls more on that IT band, it'll start pulling more on where its insertion is, which is at the level of the knee. Typically what comes about for runners is because we are very hip flexor dominant in our stride. That is typically a bit more overworked and what's underworked is that glute piece. So what I would recommend is half kneel hip flexor stretch or foam rolling the hip flexor and complement it with a little bit of glute maximus exercises or even glute medius exercises because again that it band being lateral to our thigh anytime that glute medius isn't firing it'll cause that knee to kind of deviate inwards a bit mm. especially for fatigue so if we can minimize that amount of deviation we can minimize how much of that pulling the it band has from the knee beautiful and then uh, next we got runner's knee slash just like general knee pain, I guess. Sure. So runner's knee is, there's a couple, the patellotendinopathy, I guess, would be the, the main kind of term used for that. And what I would recommend, for, if, and again, how that happens is inflammation of that tendon that attaches the kneecap onto the tibia or the shin. Mm. What I would recommend for that, because that's more... A, are you still here, Jeremy? Yeah, yeah. Can you see me? I think my... I cannot see you yet. Oh, here. Let me... Is it... My, my Wi-Fi might be, in weir be being weird. That's that's okay. Yeah, let me know when. Uh, can you hear me I at all? I can close my Wi-Fi. Can you I can still hear, you hear me? Perfectly. Okay. The cool thing with Riverside... I can, we can hear you. Yes. We can edit this out. The cool thing with Riverside is like oh, it perfect. records on my side locally and then records on your side locally. I see. So like if it cuts out... Oh, that's perfect. Just, just know that it's still recording you. Um, and if, if I cut out, I it's still recording me, but, um, it can be kind of weird sometimes. Okay. Perfect. Um, I see. okay. Can you see me or hear me? Uh, I can hear you perfectly. I cannot see you yet. Okay. Let me, um, my girlfriend might be on the Wi-Fi. <laughs> no, let you're me, good, man. Let me text her. Were you based out of Austin? 
Yeah, we're in Austin. Um, we're like at this new development area, and the Wi-Fi here is just trash. Well, uh, who are you with? Like, what's who's your provider? Uh, I we just pay it through our like rent that we pay. I think it's like AT and T or something. I'm not. I'm not really sure. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Am I still? You can't hear me. Or see I can me see yet? you. I can see okay. you perfectly. Yes. Okay. Or not perfectly, but it's a little bit pixelated. But I can see your your silhouette. Okay. Um, okay. Well, uh, we'll just take it. If we just have to do audio again, just know perfect. that it's like yeah, you, it's still recording, so we're good. Um, Amazing. Perfect. Do you want me to ask that again about runner's knee? Yeah, probably. Okay. All right. Next up, we've got <laughs> runner's knee or just general knee pain when running. Perfect. So when it comes to runner's knee, it is another fancy term for it would be patellofemoral pain syndrome. And it's a type of diagnosis they typically give when there isn't anything else that is super telling of what the injury is. As in generalized knee pain that doesn't have a specific pain pattern to it, you can't find any tender points. That's when they would give that diagnosis of patellofemoral pain syndrome or runner's knee. But again, when typically people would have that PFPS or that runner's knee is more so stemming from the idea of maltracking with maltracking with the knee itself. As in the kneecap is very mobile, there are many different structures that attach onto it, specifically muscles. If you're having some sort of imbalance with certain muscles that are working a little bit harder, other muscles that aren't working as much, that kneecap track a certain way that it shouldn't. And you won't notice the pain immediately, but you'll start to notice the pain gradually when you increase your mileage, when you go for your longer runs towards the end of it. That's when people will have that sort of pain. But typically it comes from maltracking. The biggest thing is trying to identify which structures or which muscles are tight, which ones are a little bit inactive, and trying to work kind of around that. But what I've seen for the most part is a lot of runners, they will have lateral tracking of the knee, which means that the kneecap might deviate a bit more outwards. That could be because of attachments from the IT band. It could be from attachments from the lateral musculature of the quad. So what I would recommend is try to get more VMO activa uh, activation, which is that medial or that inner quad muscle. Activate that a bit more. Have a strong foundation when it comes to the strengthening, which is, again, trying to reinforce that glute strengthening piece. And that pain should diminish from there. Beautiful. Um, is that where maybe like the uh, like Bulgarian split squats could come in or like more that eccentric kind of movement on the quad? Eccentric movements are good as in, in general when it comes to any sort of tendinopathies or knee pain. I would always encourage the eccentrics specifically for patellar tendinopathy. So as in if you have a patellar tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, there are different protocols that all revolve around the idea of eccentrics. And eccentrics for those that may not be as informed or familiar with all they are is their movements and the way i like to describe it to my patients is movements where concentrically or on the upwards of a movement you go at a normal pace the downwards of the movement try to slow it down mm. so whether that is for example if you have achilles tendonitis or tendinopathy what i would recommend is do your calf raise you can load it up a bit more but overall the tempo should be a bit different in the sense that on the upward phase, go at your normal pace. The downward phase, try to really embrace that slowness of the movement because when we load those tendons a bit more, research and the literature shows that it helps with that healing process. Mm, okay, definitely going to take that and yeah. work on that because I'm terrible at the tempo stuff during strength exercises. Temp tempos are so important. Try to emphasize, even when it comes to your squats, your Bulgarians, all those movements, deadlift maybe not as much. But other movements, I would recommend. I would recommend for sure trying to emphasize the eccentric phase of the movement because when we typically have some sort of biomechanical fault or error in our gait, it's not when we're pushing off during our stride. It's when we're landing. You'll start to see the knee caving in when we land. It happens all eccentrically. So if we're noticing these issues eccentrically, it makes sense to just emphasize that eccentric portion of our exercise when working out. Beautiful. Uh, and then we've got shin splints. This seems to be like probably the most common running injury, I feel yes, like. Yes, yes. The unfortunate thing about shin splints in terms of what the literature shows, it's, it's very mixed in terms of the cause of it. As in some people, attribute, they call it medial tibial stress syndrome as another fancy word for it. 
but there are a couple different hypotheses to how it happens. One is the structures of the muscles around the shin itself, they have attachments onto that tibia. If they have attachments onto that tibia, the idea of shin splints coming about is because there is a lot of pulling of that muscle from the shin, which is causing that irritation. That's one of the hypotheses. The other hypothesis is based off of tibial bowing, which essentially means that some people that are doing more impactful activities, such as running, they looked at how much tibial bowing do they have and what is the cases or the incidents when it comes to shin splints. What they found to be correlative, not causative, was the fact that people who had more tibial bowing, which essentially is the tibia has a very, very minor and very subtle bowing or kind of bending when you're running. Hmm. And people who had that a little bit at a higher I guess at a higher level or more that bowing happening, there was more that risk of that shin splint, but it's very hard to be causative off of that. So these are, these are just different hypotheses when it comes to the cause of it. In terms of treatment, what I would say is focus on movements such as a tibialis anterior stretch, which is again, keeping your feet in that plantar flex or bent position and just sitting on your heels. Hmm. Do that for 30 seconds and you can oscillate in and out of that stretch because it is a painful stretch and it is a bit discomforting if you're not as flexible. So I would recommend getting up into almost like a hip thrusted position, then sitting back into your onto your heels. Repeat that maybe five to 10 times just to work on that piece. Another thing I would recommend is tibialis anterior raises. So again, it's that dorsiflexion action getting that muscle a little bit more active. So a lot of people think plantar flexion or calf raises are super important. We do enough of that when we're walking. We do enough of that when we're running. Focus on the other muscle that should be a bit more balanced when it comes to that running piece, which is the tibialis anterior. I would work more so in terms of strengthening that. That could look like leaning slanted against the wall and just keeping your heels planted but lifting your toes up. Mm. That exercise, along with the kneeling tibialis anterior stretch, which is you're just sitting on your heels, would help a lot when it comes to that issue and complement it with some manual therapy, as in there are some tender points when it comes to those shins. Go over those tender points with your thumbs and just kind of try working very close to the muscle. The muscle is very, very close to where that shin is. So you're going to have to get very close to that shin just to kind of help with that stripping of the muscle, just to help with that recovery piece. Amazing. Dude, I feel like shin splints are like a rite of passage for, for all runners. Oh, 100%. Like, I don't if you know. you don't have shin splints, you don't have, you're not a runner yet. <laughs> exactly. It's uh, I also, in my experience, I, I think of it like chicken pox almost, where it's like you get it and then it sucks and then you get over it and then you like never get Goes it again. Away. It's, away. The, it's the weirdest thing. I feel like yeah. very similarly with like plantar fasciitis, runner's knee, all this stuff is like, you might get it very early on, but at least in my experience, once you get it, it, yeah. You tend to not get it again. Um, yeah. At least in Canada, in terms of shin splints, the time when they typically happen most, at least anecdotally when I see in my patients, is during the winter months. Because mm -hmm. the snow, they don't get as much of that friction when it comes to their stride. And when there is that constant slipping in your gait, that tibia or those muscles around the, the shin itself, they're working a little bit harder to almost catch your stride which leads to a lot of that irritation. So typically what I've noticed at least more anecdotally was the fact that shin splints in Canada, or at least the patients I'm seeing, they come on more so during those winter months when there is more snow on the ground. Interesting. Do you think it has anything to do with uh, like people's muscles being more tight because of the colder weather? Do you think that has anything to do with it? There are so many correlative factors to it, as in there is not one specific hypothesis. There are many. So you almost have to tackle it from all angles just to see which one works for you. It's almost like trial and error of different methods, whether it's calf stretching, whether it's a tibialis anterior raise. You have to trial and error a lot of different things and see what works for you. It could be as simple as changing your shoes. It's just you really have to get down to many different things and see kind of what works for you. It could be a mileage thing. So there are so many different hypotheses on what causes it. The main thing we know is a lot of people do have it and you just have to work around different methods of trying to improve it. That makes perfect sense. All right, we got a couple more. Um, soleus, uh, and from my understanding, soleus <laughs> is like that lower calf muscle where it kind of connects 
towards like your Achilles? Is that the best it's, description? So the best way to describe it is if you're looking at the picture of the calf, the big muscles are what we like to call the gastroc. They're the muscles that we kind of see and we like to identify as being the calf. Deep within that or just closer to the bone would be the soleus. Mm. That is a muscle that is <clears throat> more so activated or more so engaged when it comes to that running piece. Whenever we're doing calf raises, we do it usually in a standing position when our knees are in extension. When we're doing this in this way, the gastroc takes over right away. It's a bigger muscle. And when and the fact that it crosses two joints, it crosses the ankle joint, it crosses the knee. Mm. If it crosses two joints and you're essentially putting those joints on a stretch, that muscle is going to be active. It's going to be firing. So when you're doing the calf raises, you're working the gastroc. What I would recommend because the soleus is, <clears throat> it's one of those muscles that a lot of runners use when it comes to your gait, when it comes to running, is do your calf raises, have a bit of a bend to the knee just so you can offset the gas rock. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more targeted. So you can do, for example, seated calf raises. That's a good one. <clears throat> Another one I would recommend is if you're doing more compound movements, say a lunge. What I would recommend is get into a lunge position, the front leg, lift the heel up and kind of work on descending and ascending. Mm -hmm. So you're doing the lunge, but all you're doing is you have your heel raise just to target that soleus a bit more, which helps make the movement a bit more compound, a bit more effective when it comes to training and when it comes to strengthening. Beautiful. Dude, I, my soleus used to get <laughs> so tight when I first got into running. Uh, right. It would be like the most excruciating pain and like nothing would get it to go away. And I think just over time, like strengthening that whole area and, and yeah. getting used to miles made it go away. But that was like one of the worst pains I've ever had from really. Yeah. How did you how did you know it was soleus versus like maybe the Achilles? It wasn't the Achilles tendon, right? I don't think so, because it was definitely muscular. <clears throat> uh, I see. And it was it was like that weird section between like the gas rock, the, the big calf muscle and like the yeah, inside yeah. of that okay. ankle bone. I think that's soleus. I don't know. Fair enough. And and you would probably know it if you did, for example, a you planted your foot and you pretty much did a soleus stretch, which is you're just bending your knee as close to a wall as you can. Yeah. You would feel that stretch lower down on the calf instead of higher up. Yep. And if that's painful, then typically people would attribute that to being a soleus-related injury or issue. Okay, that makes total sense. All right, and the last one we'll go over is the uh, Achilles <clears throat> tendonitis. Yes. Or Achilles... Uh, I guess general Achilles issues. Sure. Tendonitis is just one of those words. The itis part of it, they just mean inflammation. And a lot of these different conditions, they're very torn between whether there is an inflammatory component to it. So a more generalized word they use for conditions that involve the tendon is a tendinopathy. And opathy okay. just means that it's more general issue with that specific tendon. But same thing. Um, when it comes to the Achilles tendonitis, that can stem from a plethora of things. It can be the tightness in the calf. It can be the weakness in the calf. It can be the fact that when you're running, you don't have as much of that strength or involvement or activation in that calf. And when we say calf, we're not just saying the gastroc. We're seeing the gastroc and we're seeing the soleus because those two merge and they form the Achilles tendon. Mm. So if you're just doing calf raises and you're still noticing that pain, try to do calf raises with your knee bent. Calf raises with your knee bent or the seated calf raise machine you might see at the gym. When you're doing the seated calf raise machine, you target the soleus, which is a very underappreciated muscle that doesn't get trained as much. And being able to train that muscle along with the gastroc is super helpful to managing that specific condition. On top of that, what I would recommend is very helpful would be manual therapy, as in take your thumbs, rub it along that Achilles tendon, get some massage or if you can go to a massage therapist and kind of work that out or a physiotherapist. On top of that, adopt the eccentric movements and the eccentric tempoing when it comes to the Achilles. And what that means again is when you're doing your calf raises, whether it is a standing calf raise or whether it is a seated calf, calf raise to target the soleus, go up at a normal pace, really try to emphasize that slowness of the descent. As in when you're lowering it eccentrically, make sure you do it very slowly just so that tendon can be a bit more loaded and research shows that that helps the best when it comes to that healing process. Beautiful, dude. This was uh, this was fun, man. You, you gave so much information. We answered a ton of different questions. And uh, if I had to summarize 
kind of everything that you went over today. I would say like just a couple of things is like be aware of your body, f- develop that intuition for how you feel and pay attention to, to all these different things on a daily basis. And then two, just be preventative, uh, mostly through strength training, different stretches. And uh, yeah, I think uh, obviously I, I think the fundamentals of all this should just be strength train because I feel like it's just so common with runners to avoid strength training because they're worried about putting on size, being too big and bulky, but you don't have to do that for, to, to be a good, strong runner and prevent injuries. I saw your post maybe a couple months ago that you were comparing your times when you were a little bit more heavy versus when you were lighter and not as fast maybe. And that is the biggest thing I want people to be aware of. It's not so much about the weight. It's about what the weight distribution is like. As in, if you have more muscle, it's not a bad bad thing. As long as you're more functional with it, you're still complementing it with a good running base. That is more than sufficient. If anything, it's more optimal when it comes to training for a race to have a bit more of that strengthening piece there. And what will typically happen when you have that strength piece there is you might put on a little bit more muscle mass which it will not be uncommon to put on maybe a little bit of weight when it comes to checking the scale. A lot of my patients, a lot of runners, novice runners that want to get into running, there is a lot of fixation when it comes to the specifics of training, the specifics of how fast should I go for this segment or that segment. My biggest thing is first work on building up a base. Build a strong base, build up some mileage, and then when you have that good cardiovascular base, Then you can get into the specifics of interval training, into tempos, into fartleks, into different workouts. But a lot of times, stick to the basics before we get into the specifics of it. Because we need to build up that cardiovascular base before we can get a bit more specific or fancy with the workouts. Yeah, that's beautifully said, dude. I I always like to think of it as functional muscle mass or or functional body mass versus non-functional body mass, meaning like you just described it perfectly as like muscle versus fat essentially is like, and even like there is non-functional muscle when it comes to running, Um, Mm -hmm. but just being intentional with training and intentional with the style of workouts that you're doing and just trying to dial it in for what your goals are, which obviously if it's running, then you want to exercise and lift as if you're trying to optimize your running completely um dude so this is a ton of fun man i really appreciate you coming on here and uh sharing all this knowledge with us what what is the the like the the next goal or what's the vision for for omid what are you trying to do within the physiotherapy space and within running so my biggest thing is trying to <clears throat> again, the same thing you're doing when it comes to the you're, you're vocalizing and you're trying to spread the awareness when it comes to that strengthening piece and how important it is, not from just an injury perspective, but from a performance optimization perspective. It's so important anecdotally in terms of what the literature shows. There is so much evidence that it has such a beneficial effect in terms of improving your times, helping you become prepared for races. So my biggest thing is trying to integrate a lot of the running into my physiotherapy practice and vice versa. And I'm trying to begin a bit more of that run community within Toronto and try to provide runners, whether it's novice or more experienced, a good basis when it comes to injury prevention exercises, assessment from a physiotherapy perspective, and training programs that make sense, as in not trying to get the high mileage only, but trying to up the mileage in a smart way, progressively, and also complement it with a foundational strengthening program that is effective, that is specific, and that is overall beneficial for a runner. I love that, dude. I love the mission that you're that you're going after and obviously you've got a plethora of knowledge and information to share with the world and um i think you're doing a great job of of spreading that and i mean coming on the podcast was uh was one of the best ways you could you could uh go about doing that too so i I really appreciate it man i appreciate you jeremy i appreciate that you have this podcast and this platform that you like to share well evidenced information and you like to present it in a way that is very layman for everyone to understand and apply and being able to be on this mission and being able to do it through the lens of your own journey is so beneficial and for someone like myself i am very immersed when it comes to that fitness that running that strengthening piece but being able to see your content too i take a lot of inspiration from your training methods in terms of what you do in terms of 
what your program looks like. I think there's a lot of good inspiration there and you do definitely inspire a lot of people. So thank you for that. Thanks, man. Do you do you have a podcast of your own or do you have uh, a place where you create content and, and put stuff out there? I have Saber Running, which is on, I'm on Instagram and I have my website, which is saberrunning.com. I also have my physiotherapy that? page. It is S-A-B-R running.com. And okay. I have my Instagram, which is under the Saber Running, but I have my personal Instagram, which I should probably get into more of a professional one for my physiotherapy stuff. But for now, if you wanted to reach out to me, it can be either the Saber Running Instagram or www.saberrunning.com. And Physiomid is the branding, I guess, I go under when it comes to the physiotherapy side of things. So if you wanted to do a quick Google search, you can kind of find me there. Feel free to reach out if anyone had any questions when it comes to that running piece, strengthening, injury prevention. I'm more than, help, uh, more than happy to help anyone that is willing to apply these principles and these foundations when it comes to improving their overall wellness. Amazing, dude. Go check him out. Omid, thank you again for coming on the podcast. I'll make sure to put all your links and stuff down in the, uh, the description. I the appreciate episode. it so much, Jeremy. Thank again, you for having dude, I, me. This was a blast. Of course, man. All right, we'll talk to you later. Take care, friend. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure to subscribe to the channel, leave a review, and share it with a friend. We'll see you in the next one.